Right. So the FTC is known as the Federal Trade Commission, and they are an organization, a government agency. Um, they're independent. They're run by the U.S. government, right? And they have uh, authority to um, basically uh, have uh, orders against you. They can. They report scams. They give out guidelines, um, and they directly can impact your organization because the FTC, while it's not any private right of action, the FTC can take action for illegal conduct if you are going against the FTC standards. The FCC is the Federal Communications Commission. They have the authority to implement the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. So they have a ton of authority, um, you know, uh, both on courts, right, to implement the law, define the law, define what it looks like, just like they recently did with the one-to-one, -one, the new one-to-one -one consent rules. Uh, and they will, they dictate what you can and cannot do when it comes from outbound calling and text messaging. Then the CFPB is a different organization with Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and that is also an independent agency that is um, primarily for making sure that if you're a financial, if you're in the financial sector, right, so your mortgage companies and lenders, and they they have their own guidelines on how, you know, your lending practices should and can look like. So a lot of it's going to come down to your consent language, and there's a, there's a lot of different layers here. So let's say that when you are acquiring your lead, you captured consent to call them, and your language had some sort of verbiage about, you know, we have consent to call you, even if your number is on the do not call list. If you've captured that consent, and then they put themselves on the do not call list, as long as you have consent that says that you can call them, you should be okay using that consent for the, the lifetime of that. Pooja, do you agree with that before I go on? Yes. So the the consent, I think what you're getting at, Isaac, is not going to expire unless you right. have a do not call list, correct? Right. So if from a, somebody putting themselves on the, the federal list or one of the state do not call lists, as long as you captured consent, you're okay. Now, where this gets murky is you've got to keep in mind things like you're still required to keep your own do not call list. So you have your own do not call list. Uh, the client calls in and the client says, hey, I may or may not be on the national do not call list, doesn't matter. I don't want to talk to your business anymore. You have to put them on the do not call list. Uh, New York, interestingly, just proposed a bill the other day where you have to put them on any list that you maintain, but that's kind of a separate topic. Um, you look at the, the the requirements to keep them under do not call list, you need to be checking that regularly. Uh, there is uh, the current guy, I think the new rule update is 10 days is what you have to honor a do not call request. Um, Correct. Technology should enable you to do it even faster. And if somebody said, "Don't, I don't want to talk to you anymore, you're probably wasting your time calling them anyway. Now, where it can get trickier is when you talk about someone who you didn't capture consent to. You did not capture do not call consent. If they're not on a do not call list, depending on the state you're in, you're probably still good to call them. You have certain states where you have to have full consent for a sales call, like uh, Texas, for example. If you're calling a mobile phone, you need to have consent regardless of do not call status. Um, but let's say that they then add themselves to the do not call list. Uh, so you didn't have do not call consent. They put themselves on the do not call list. Do you have to stop calling them immediately? And the question is that depends uh, because there are exemptions for things like existing business relationships and inquiries and things like that that are honored in some states, but not all. So bottom line, it gets very complicated and that and the rules change somewhat regularly. So this is the kind of thing where there's it's it's very gray depending on what you do. And you need to have regular compliance reviews with your in-house compliance team. And I would recommend on a regular basis you have qualified outside counsel review your in-house practices on a regular basis. Yep. And to kind of piggyback on Pooja, I mean, it all starts with vendor vetting. So if you have partners, you should really have a vetting process in place that's documented. You should have a questionnaire that they're filling out. Um, you should use your partners like either like Isaac's company or my company or anybody else out there. I don't care who you use. We don't want the industry shut down. Just use someone <laughs> um, to go out and take a look and they're going to fill out the form, but go and take a look and see what they're doing. It's really not that difficult to go out and kind of really 
um, even just manually, go out and take a look and see what your partners might be up to. Um, so take a look. Um, don't take everyone at their word. Uh, do your due diligence and do some monitoring. Make sure that you're using all the tools at your disposal. Um, you know, the really the kicker in this one is that private right of action, right? Because you know, if you're doing something with the CFPB or the FTC, uh, we all know they have so much manpower. And so I think in the in you know the history, people have felt <clears throat> pretty comfortable that it might not be them that they go after. But with this, I mean it's a lot more likely that someone's coming after you. So just don't even risk it.